And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Joshua chapter 6, we're in a series called Taking the Limits Off God. You know, it says in Psalm 78, verse 41, that the children of Israel limited God time and time again. And when you and I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we don't want to have the Lord say, I love you, I'm glad you're here, but you limited what I wanted to do in your life. You and I want to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God. And uh, this is, uh, in this chapter, this is the story of Israel's very first battle in taking of the promised land. And God gives Joshua and the army of Israel a very unconventional battle plan, and they obeyed God's word, and they prospered. They were victorious. We'll start at verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Jericho was securely shut up. This was actually a small city. A number of years ago, Kathy and I were in Israel, and we had the the privilege of walking around the ruins of the city of Jericho. The walls only encompassed about seven acres, and that means that most of the residents lived outside the city, but they all had to come inside the city for safety. It was a small city, but it was well fortified. It had massive double walls that surrounded it. In fact, those walls were so, were so sturdy that people could build their houses. How many of you like to build a house on top of a wall? That's what Rahab the prostitute did. They built their houses on top of the, the wall. And you know what? The Bible says that they were securely shut up because of the children of Israel. I just want to suggest to you that sometimes our lives can be securely shut up for all the wrong reasons. Sometimes our lives can be bound with strongholds. See, see, a stronghold is a system of thought empowered by your emotions that's contrary to the will of God and the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we don't do warfare according to the flesh. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down, for the destruction of strongholds, casting down every high and lofty thought that was raised itself up against the knowledge of Christ. So a stronghold is a system of thought empowered by our emotions that's contrary to the Word of God. And here's the deal. How does a stronghold get in your life? It starts with your thinking. And then when you add actions and you add deeds and you add a commitment to that stronghold, here's what happened. The devil will come along because at that point in time you're committing sin and the devil will will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay because sin gives the devil a legal right to traffic in your life. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm just saying that that even as this city was securely shut up, there are some people that are securely shut up. There are even Christians that have strongholds in their life. Strongholds like anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment. Strongholds like lust and greed. And I know when I mention the, the word lust, we immediately think of sexual lust. But you know, lust is simply a strong desire to have something that you really shouldn't have. Strongholds like lying and deceitfulness. Uh, it, it's amazing to me how David, the king, af- the man after God's own heart, when he committed adultery f- with Bathsheba, immediately he became a liar. When he committed adultery, immediately he became a deceitful person. He became a manipulator. He tried to manipulate her husband in going and sleeping with her. You know, sometimes we can have a stronghold inside us of a negative self-image where we look inside and we don't have a picture of success. We have a picture of failure. And sometimes we have strongholds of fear and anxiety. And I know this doesn't apply to anybody in this house, but some people, believe it or not, have a stronghold of control. They are control freaks. Everybody look at me. Nobody intends to become a control freak. But people learn at an early age that it's more comfortable to be in control than to be afraid. And so the way they deal with all their fears is by trying to exert control over every part of life. And dear ones, you know you're a control freak when you have a hard time trusting God.
Amen. Just, just thought I'd mention that. Here's the deal. Thank God that deliverance is available through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliverance starts with confessing our sins. Again, because, because remember this, sin gives the devil a legal right to traffic in your life. So 1 John 1 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then you need to find some mature believers who will lay hands on you and cast that thing out. You say, well, I didn't think a Christian could be possessed. I didn't say you're possessed, but you can be oppressed by a demonic spirit and you need to get deliverance from that spirit of oppression. I used to be bound by a spirit of anger. I used to be bound. I didn't realize it, but I was really bound by bitterness. And I finally broke my pride And I went to a Christian friend and I said, I got an issue. This anger keeps welling up inside me. And this brother began to pray with me. And he said, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? And I just got quiet and I just listened to the Lord. And I heard the word grace. And I said, I hear the Holy Spirit saying the word grace. And then I thought of that scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul says, His grace is sufficient for me, for His strength is made perfect in my weakness. And I continued to pray, and I realized that I had unforgiveness in my heart towards a lot of people. I said, Lord... Just how much unforgiveness do I have? Because I prayed prayers of forgiveness to somebody. I used to, I heard Larry Lee one time preach on Matthew chapter 6 on the Lord's Prayer. And where Jesus taught us to pray, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And Larry had taught, he says, just keep your will set on forgiveness. That if somebody hurts you, you're going to forgive. So that's what I tried to do. But I was forgiving from my head, not forgiving from my heart. And I began to sit on our back porch Every night that I didn't have obligations with the church, I sat on the back porch and I just began to pray and I say, Jesus, cleanse my heart. I didn't know I had bitterness towards other people. Lord, show me my heart. And the Lord showed me a lot of things, but I remember one of the first ones. I suddenly I saw an image of a man who used to attend our church in Illinois. And this fellow had been a preacher at one time. Now, when you, when you birth a church, you don't have a facility. And so we were meeting in an elementary school. And on Wednesday nights, we didn't have any place to meet. And so I formed a Bible study in, in, in the suburbs along the North Shore of Chicago. And I had a Bible study on, 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 on Tuesday night and on Thursday night in a different home. And the study started at 7 o'clock. So I would usually arrive about 645. What I noticed is that I started getting to this particular house at 645 and there were already 15 people there. And I thought, this is amazing. They're getting here early. So we went ahead and had our Bible study and prayer time and it was good. The next week I arrived at 645 and there were again 15 people there already. And one lady looked at me and said, you're not supposed to be here. I said, I'm not supposed to be here? Hmm. Am I the pastor of the church? Yeah, and I'm not supposed to be here, huh? She says, no, so-and-so is prophesying to all of us. And so this other guy who had been a pastor had, had told people to come early, and he would prophesy to them. Well, it wasn't long before that man came to me and said, I think I'm going to start a church and we're going to start it out of this Bible study. And so we found ourselves, we were only one year old. Jack, we're only up to about 45 people. And now he's taking 15 people out. Now, Kathy and I had, had cashed in our retirement and that's what we're living on. And with 45 people, you had a few more ties coming in. So things were looking better. And suddenly now we're, 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 we're going backwards. Suddenly we're, we're losing 15 people. We're losing 15 givers. And, you know, I, I read in Matthew chapter 6, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said, when people treat you wrong, you're supposed to bless them and do good and pray for them and, and love them. And, and so I brought the brother up to the front of the, our small church. And in fact, I brought all those that were getting ready to start this new group. We brought them up front and, and I prayed for them and I blessed them and we gave them a financial gift. And I gave this brother a, 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 a wonderful leather bound Bible and I tried to do it right. But, you know, inside... I was hurt. 
I felt like this guy was deceptive. I mean, if he wanted to start a church, that's one thing he could go start his church, but don't go start it out of somebody else's church, man. I'm just trying to get it going. I was hurt. So all these years later, now I'm sitting on my back porch and I'm saying, God, where do I have unforgiveness? And the Holy Spirit whispers to my heart and says, you've got hatred in your heart towards that man. And I had to confess it before the Lord and say, Jesus, would you come and heal my heart? I forgive him even as God in Christ has forgiven me. And you know what? I forgive from the heart. And let me tell you what real forgiveness is. Real forgiveness is tearing up the IOUs. Because here's the problem. Many of us, we go through life. Teenagers, listen to me. Getting ready to tell you a story about something that happened to me when I was a teenager. You can collect IOUs. Look at what that person did. Look at what that man or woman did. And I had to, before the Lord, I had to tear up the IOU. Because how many of you know that's what Jesus does for you and me? (laughs) When we repent of our sins, when we come to faith in Christ, He takes our sins and moves them as far as the east is from the west. And I had to tear up those IOUs. And as I sat there, I just kept saying, Lord, where else do I have unforgiveness? And suddenly I remembered something that happened when I was a teenager. Because when I was 15 years of age, my dad went into full-time ministry. He left the business world and he became, he'd been an insurance salesman and he was an entrepreneur. And he began traveling full-time. And there were some people in our church at that time, which was over at Bloxham Heights. There were some people who said some very unkind things about my dad about my mom, and it got back to me. And I had hardened my heart. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they've made this value judgment against my family. And do you know what? I had carried that unforgiveness for years and years and years. I had carried a spirit of judgment in my heart. I had carried a a sense of moral superiority in me. Come on now. We judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. Amen? The moment I begin to hate another man, I become his slave. I'll never escape his tyrannical grasp on my mind. Bitterness is drinking poison and hoping it affects the other person. Let me tell you something. You can be bitter and you can hold grudges towards other people, but it won't affect anybody but you. And I'd done it so much till I had this anger that would come up inside me and I wouldn't know where it was coming from. I had this anger that would come out of nowhere. I could be fine one minute and the next minute I'm angry. It's because you can only throw so much stuff in a closet and keep closing the door until everything in that closet is going to start coming out. Amen? Dear ones, you can only take a tennis ball and throw it up against a brick wall for so long until that tennis ball starts coming back at you. And you can only harbor unforgiveness for so long in your heart until it starts coming back at you. And I'm just telling you that there's deliverance. I'm telling you that you don't have to live with bitterness. You don't have to live with unforgiveness. Everybody's got a somebody's done me wrong song. Come on. Everybody in here, if, if I took a microphone and asked you how many people had, had treated you wrongly, how many people had, 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 had treated your parents wrong, treated your family wrong, how many people had stolen from you, how many people had lied about you, how many people had plotted evil against you, every one of us could could, could tell story after story after story but thank God that Jesus Christ forgave it all on the cross that Jesus said it is finished you and I don't have to depend upon the blood of lambs and goats anymore we can now depend upon the blood of the sacrifice God himself Jesus Christ the king of glory hallelujah and I'm telling you whom the son is set free is free indeed I'm often asked pastor is this person did this to me or this person did that to me I forgive them but I just can't trust them well let me say this forgiveness and trust are two different things I mean, you, maybe you were molested by somebody. You can forgive them, but that doesn't mean you've got to trust them again. Because trust is earned, right? But you forgive because it hurt. you don't want it to, to affect you. You don't want it to destroy you. Man, I came out of that thing, and I, that's when I wrote this book, The Danger of Anger. And I get letters from people all, all across the country saying I, I could, didn't understand what was causing the anger? I didn't understand what was causing the, 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 the emotional outburst in my life. 
Hallelujah. Who, who would like to have a copy today? Noel, come on up. I just saw, saw your hand first. I saw, who, who was in this middle section of here? I saw a hand go up. Come, come on, John. You just come get it. Okay, good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God that there's forgiveness. Thank God. Well, look at verse 1 with me again, and we'll get into this text. It says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. Jericho's in a defense mode. Jericho says, we're not going to surrender. But the inhabitants of Jericho did not know that Israel wasn't going to fight with traditional weapons. Israel was actually going to, going to stand and still and watch God fight their battles. God was going to fight with an angel army. Amen? Hebrews 1.14 says angels are ministering spirits to those of us that are heirs of salvation. And I'm just telling you, God wants to fight your battles for you today. Verse 2, and the Lord said to Joshua, see, everybody say see. The Lord says, see, I've given Jericho into your hand, its kings, its mighty men of valor. He says, Joshua, before the battle begins, I want you to get a vision of victory. Now, it's so important that you not wait until something difficult comes in your life, but that you get a vision of victory for your life before it comes. Joshua is told by God, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and its mighty men of Valor, And in this life, you'll either carry a vision of victory or a vision of defeat. On, on, on Friday, I got to play golf with Dr. Chip Hall. Dr. Hall, just raise your hand back here. He's right back here. I got to play golf with, with, with Chip. And, uh, and uh, I had taken a lesson when I was in Georgia up at the Atlanta National Club. I took a lesson and um, they were changed my swing. And uh, if you, if you, how many, it, I won't ask if you play golf. Let me just say this. If you do play golf, you know that it, it looks a lot easier than it is. And it's really important that you swing on plane and that you, and that the club face is square when it hits the ball. And, and I had a lousy first nine holes. I mean, I just, I was thinking too much. You can, you can get in the paralysis of analysis and you can just outthink things at times. But the back nine, I started thinking, you know, Jesus is the glory. He's the lifter of my head. <laughs> Nobody knows what you're thinking out there. Come on. <laughs> and Lord Jesus, nothing can separate me from your love. And I'm just going to quit thinking and start having fun. In fact, uh, Trent's bringing me this club. See, see if, you start, if, if you start to think too much... You know, you're, you're thinking about your mechanics and what's going on. And what, what you got to do is just not think too much. <laughs> Hit that one a little hard, didn't I? Let's try over here. I started thinking about Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded. Did you get it, Betty? Good job. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creation can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll tell you what, that's a whole lot better to think about that when you're hitting a golf ball than to think now, am I, am I addressing it now? Am I, let's see, one third, two thirds, is it square? You know, it's a whole lot better just to... I should have used a, ch uh, a chipping iron, shouldn't I? <laughs> Thank you, Trent. Hallelujah. Pastor and Sister Brown, I've just seen you this morning. It's good to see you guys here today. Amen. Give these guys a big hand of applause. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Pastor Brown served this church for 16 years. Just did a fantastic job. Amen. Well, look at verse 2. 
And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. I want you to get this vision of victory. And that phrase I have given is in the prophetic perfect tense. It's a tense that expresses a completed action. In other words, God says, I have given this into your hand. From God's perspective, it had already been done. I said, from God's perspective, it had already been done. So you know what God was saying to Joshua? Just chill out. Relax. Obey me. It's, gonna, it's, it's all going to take place. Amen? Look at verse 3. You shall march around the city. All you men of war, you shall go all around the city. This you shall do for six days. See, God could have destroyed Jericho without Israel's participation. But there's something about miracles. There's something about your growth in in Christ. There's something about sanctification. God wants you and I to play a role. God wants you and I to participate. Sometimes we just will pray and say, God, do this, do that. And God's waiting for you and me to get involved to actually bring that miracle To pass, and I'll tell you why, because God wants you to have a story to tell because a person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. Try that again. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. And God wants to do some things in you so he can do some things through you. Amen? Amen. Verse 4, and the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast of the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Then the Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who was armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was, when Joshua had spoken to the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. Now let's stop right there at verse 10 and camp for a minute. You shall not shout or make a noise with your voice, Nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. I think that this perhaps was the hardest commandment that God gave to the nation of Israel that day. Be quiet. Turn to somebody and say, your commandment is to be quiet. (laughs) See, some of us, we don't like that, huh? You don't like somebody telling you not to be able to talk. (laughs) He says, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice. Huh. You got to think, think about this for a minute. They're, they're walking around this city and they're exposed to danger and ridicule from the Canaanites because they're up on top of the roofs and they're hanging out the windows. They could be dropping things on their head. They could be yelling insults at them. But you're not to talk. You're not to say anything. All you're supposed to do is to march. In other words, your orders are to wait, to walk, and not talk. Let's try that together. Wait. Walk and not talk. That's exactly what they were doing. (laughs) Now see, God and Joshua understood the reason that Israel needed to keep silence. It was because 40 years earlier, when the 12 spies went out to spy out the land, they couldn't keep silent. They kept talking about what their natural mind saw instead of what God intended to do for them. Let's look at Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. Here's what the spies said. They said, we went up to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. 
The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of the giant there. See, 40 years earlier, Joshua and Caleb had looked at the walls of this city of Jericho. And they had had a different response. They said, hey, we can take this city. In fact, look at verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we the land is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature there we saw the giants the descendants of Anak came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight so we were in their sight dear ones if you magnify your problems more than you magnify God you're going to feel like a grasshopper you're going to look at yourself and you're going to see a grasshopper and the devil wants to give you a grasshopper mentality mentality the devil wants to intimidate he wants to kill he wants to steal and he wants to destroy verse 12 joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the lord then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the lord went on continually everybody say continually They went on continually and blew with the trumpets. Why were the trumpets blowing continually? Because they were sending a message. The king is here. They're marching with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a wooden box covered with gold. It was made of acacia wood. Inside that ark was, was, was the Ten Commandments. There was some manna. There was Aaron's rod that budded. But on top of the ark were two angels. They were called cherubim. And they had been carved out of wood and covered with gold. And their wings met at the very top. And God said, I myself dwell between the wings of the cherubim. You see, God used to dwell in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But now he says, I'm dwelling between the wings of the cherubim and they're marching around the city the soldiers but also the priest with the ark and the priest blowing the trumpets and they're blowing trumpets of worship the king is here the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob the God that created heaven and earth the king is here and they blew the trumpets and the children of Israel were actually worshiping God and the Canaanites didn't have a clue Verse 14, and the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day. And they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Hey, they've not been able to talk for seven days. Now he says, shout. He says, shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. They shouted in worship. They shouted in praise. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. That wall didn't fall down flat because they hit some kind of of note or tone that destabilized the foundation of those walls. That wall fell down flat because the angel armies, the captain of the army of the host of the Lord, the angel armies began to get active because they began to worship because they begin to praise and dear ones every one of us needs to learn the power of worship and the power of praise there have been so many times in my life when nothing was going right when everything inside me just wanted to quit when everything inside me wanted to give up but I've learned that if I'll get alone with God and spend some time reading his word and then spend some time in worship I'm going to tell you something yokes are broken and a new spirit comes into that place and I'm going to tell you it's because the God of the angels Angel armies shows up and he knows how to topple the walls in your life. He knows how to break every yoke of bondage. He knows how to destroy every stronghold. He knows my dad used to preach and say, God will make a fix that'll fix the fix that the devil tried to put on you. How'd that go, Dad? God would fix the fix. That would take care of the devil's fix. Okay. In other words, God will, 
God will fix a fix that'll take care of the devil's fix. Let me tell you something. There's an enemy and his name is Lucifer. He was cast down from heaven because he was trading with the anointing. He was trading. And Ezekiel chapter 28 says that he was filled with iniquity. He was trading with the anointing. That's how he was able to influence a third of the angels and get them to, to, to join him. They were thrown out of heaven and they became demons because he was trafficking in the anointing. In other words, he was, he was the anointed cherub that covers. He was covered with all kinds of beautiful stones. His job was to give glory to God. His job was to reflect God's glory. But he became manipulative and he began trading in the anointing. In other words, he began using his position position as heaven's worship leader to benefit himself. He became manipulating. He became controlling. He was trading in the anointing. That's exactly is what he was doing. And dear ones, I'm going to tell you something. The devil, he's still about his business of killing, stealing, and destroying. Because what do you find in Washington, D.C. today? You find manipulation. You find control. What do you find in, in, in major parts of the business world today? You find manipulation. You find control. What do you find in some parts of the education word, world? What do you find in the, in the world of the arts? You'll find educa- you'll find manipulation. You'll find control. But I'm telling you that in the name of Jesus, there is victory and there is freedom for those that will come to the Lord and say, God, I don't want that stuff in my life. I don't want to be a manipulating preacher. I don't want to be a manipulating pastor. I don't want to be a controlling personality. I don't want any of that stuff that caused the devil to get thrown out of heaven. But Lord Jesus, whom you set free, is free indeed. Hallelujah. So they blew the trumpets six days in a row. They're marching around. Their job was to wait, to walk, and not talk. But they're blowing the trumpets. They're, they're, They're saying the king is in residence here. The God of glory is right here. He's dwelling between the wings of the cherubim again. Just a few days earlier, he had been in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, but now he's dwelling between the wings of the cherubim. They're saying, the king is in residence here. Dear ones, Fast forward to the New Testament. When Jesus proclaimed, it is finished, the veil of the temple was rent in two signifying that the Holy Ghost would no longer be kept in a man-made place. Now, when you and I come to Christ, our bodies become the Holy of Holies. Our bodies become the temples of the Holy Ghost. You need to go through life blowing the trumpet. You need to blow the trumpet and say the king is in residence here. Now watch this. You're having a bad golf day. (laughs) The king is in residence here. I'm going to stop overthinking this thing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing's going your way. The king is in residence right here. The king of glory lives inside me. Greater is he. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will also give life to your mortal body. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all According to the power that works where? Within us is what Ephesians 3 says. According to the power that works within us. I'm telling you, saints, we're not carrying the Holy of Holies around anymore on an ark between poles. Today, you are the Holy of Holies because Jesus is your Lord. And the Holy Ghost lives inside you. And the greater one lives inside you. And the greater one inside you has never had a bad day. The greater one inside you has never gotten confused playing golf. Come on. The greater one inside you is God Almighty. Hallelujah. You say, I need the Lord. Bow your head, close your eyes. Nobody moving, nobody talking right now. 
Bow your heads, close your eyes. In Jesus' mighty name. You say, Terrell, I just need, I need God in a whole new way. I need the Lord today. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved today. I want to give you an opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. There's some of you here today, you've known the Lord, but you've not been walking with him. You've known the Lord, but you've gotten distant in your relationship. Maybe something happened. Maybe, maybe you went through a bankruptcy. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you lost a marriage. Maybe you've had health problems. Maybe, maybe you've had other kind of problems. I want you to know he's as close as the mention of his name. And the Spirit of God would say, today's your day. Today's your day to reestablish relations with me. Today's your day. I want everybody to stand again. Nobody talking, nobody moving right now. This is not a time to go to the restroom. Just stand very reverently and tell you the king is in residence here. You'd say, Terrell, that's me. I really need Jesus today. I really need the Lord. I I, I want to come back to the Lord today. Just lift your hands up and and leave it up until I see it. Leave your hand up until I see it and we'll make eye contact. Thank you. Would you? you, Yes, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just say, Terrell, I really need Jesus today. I really need the Lord today. Just, Just raise your hand and leave it up until I see it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'll tell you, the Lord wants you to sound the trumpet because the king, the king is in residence today. The king is in residence today. Amen. Amen. Just make eye contact with me. Just make eye contact with me. You're saying today, today I want the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Pastor Zach to come and Pastor Zach standing here on your left hand side. For those of you that just raised your hand, I'm going to ask you just to make your way down here. Make your way right now. Just say, he just wants to pray with you. Then he wants to give you some materials that will help you. Just just come right down here to Pastor Zach. We're going to pray a prayer in support of her. There are others of you that raised your hand. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come. I want to give you an opportunity to come. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray this prayer out loud in support of of, of our friend. Pray it out loud. Say, Lord God, today I trust your shed blood as the full payment for all of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I forsake them. Come fill me, Holy Spirit. Change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind just going with Pastor Zach right back here, he's got some materials he's going to give you, and, and it won't take long at all. Hallelujah. Members of the altar team, would you come and stand across the front? Altar team members are coming. If you've got things going on in your life that you'd like to have prayer for, if you'd like to have prayer for healing, maybe you'd like to be... We're just one week away from Pentecost Sunday. Maybe you'd like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. These men and women want to pray for you. These altars are open. Hallelujah. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel is all about making the name of Jesus famous and his church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth, 
and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.